After a period of relative calm, relative for this war, mind, scores of missiles have evaded Ukraine's defences and struck targets across the country. The Russians, well, they targeted energy infrastructure, power lines, power plants, including one nuclear, plunging hundreds of thousands into cold and darkness. But plenty of civilian targets were also destroyed, either by accident or design. And frankly, it's happened so often now, the assumption has to be they were targeted intentionally. Still, the Russians claim the barrage was in response to what they described as a terrorist attack on Russian territory in Bryansk. Others point to the bloody, entrenched battles around Bakhmut on the eastern frontier. The Russians have lost tens of thousands of troops, attempting to take and hold a time not exactly thought of as desperately strategically significant. With the tempo of the conflict expected to accelerate significantly as the country comes out of winter, we appear no closer to a conclusion than on day one of the war. I'm Neil Patterson, and this is the Sky News Daily. Our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey, was in Kyiv when the attack took place. Ukraine is never going to give up. Uh, I just think that that's, it, this could go on forever, but they're just not going to give up. We will be hearing much more from him shortly. But the story of the day is that barrage of missiles that struck across the country. We were sent this voice note from Ukrainian MP Andrei Ozachuk, who's in Kyiv. We had another... A mass missile attack on Ukraine. The officials are reporting that more than 13 uh, regions uh, were under attack. Uh, Kiev is one of them. Um, it was in Kiev. It was in early morning. It was pretty loud. Uh, as officials said, that air defense was uh, actively working. A number of missiles were shut down. But unfortunately, uh, some missiles reached targets. Uh, I was at home in this Kiev downtown. They continue hunting on civilians only. They continue uh, targeting civilians. But now we know that it is the, the nature of uh, a horrific uh, Kremlin regime. I'm sure that uh, we will stay strong and I'm sure that uh, none of further missiles can change uh, anything in Ukraine and especially of our readiness uh, to fight till the end. Uh, and we see that the victory is not our wish, it's upcoming reality. Let's bring in our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey, in Kyiv. Um, Stuart, sounds like a hell of a morning. This has been a pretty big attack by the Russians on Ukraine. 81 missiles of various descriptions fired across an awful lot of the country. The aim of these attacks in the past has been to go for the energy infrastructure of Ukraine to try and break that down, break down normal life, upset the population, if you like. But a large number of residential areas and actually even farmhouses were hit as well. I've just come back from one residential area. There's about five or six completely burnt out cars from where the missiles struck and started a fire which spread between all of those vehicles. Dozens upon dozens of apartment windows, as you might expect, have been smashed or cracked from the force of the blast. And people, I was asking them, you know, are you getting used to this? Is it, it's, it's gone on for over a year now. Is the war something that you just accept is happening? And actually, they say they're not getting used to it. They live in fear at night and they're angry about what's happening. But not one person I've spoken to has shown any doubt that it's the right thing that Ukraine keeps fighting. And it's sort of they hope there's going to be peace. But then they sort of they accept that even as ordinary citizens woken in the early morning by a huge explosion, it is something that just happens to them and they've just got to accept it. But but is terrorising the civilian population still, you know, a, a major part of the Russian strategy? They, they do not have infinite numbers of missiles and for them to be, we presume, targeting these places, they're, they're clearly hoping still that it would have that effect. We're hearing from the Ukrainian authorities that hypersonic missiles uh, were used. Now, President Putin often talks about them because he describes them as the, the missile that NATO can't beat. In fact, nobody can beat because it, it, the speed that it travels, it can't actually be shot down. But he doesn't actually have that many. In the past, there's been greater power outages than we saw from this particular 
a series of, of attacks. So it may be that uh, their air defence systems are just continuing to improve so they could stop the severity or the implications from any attack from Russia. But it is wanting, as you say, to to try to wear the Ukrainian people down. And I have to say, it simply isn't working. Why was a delay for three weeks? Well, one theory was that maybe they're running out of weapons. Maybe that's the case. Difficult to know. But certainly, this was a, a, sig- a very significant event by the Russians. And it's not that it completely unexpected. Just I think after three weeks of relative quiet across the country, it is always comes as a shock to the ordinary people. Stuart, you've mentioned the, the, the targeting of infrastructure, particularly the power infrastructure. How concerned should we be that the electricity has been cut off to the nuclear power plant at Zaporizhia? There is huge concern about the power plant. It's running on generators at the moment because it's been being cut off from the grid. And obviously, nuclear power plants have to have electricity continuously so that they can keep the reactors cool. It's just a, an accepted given worldwide. It's diesel generators can keep going for 10 days. The position seems to be that power can be reconnected and it can be fixed. Both sides have accused the other of attempting to bomb it or not look after it correctly. And it is very, very serious. I mean, obviously, without power, you you get a meltdown. It's the biggest a nuclear power plant in Europe, and it, it really has to be secured somehow. But in this dreadful war, trying to get agreement between these two sides is nigh on impossible. And so the hope is that at some point, everyone will see sense and they, that actually it is left alone by all sides and, and no soldiers are even near it and nobody tries to attack one or another around it. But there's not been much sense talked uh, in this war, particularly from the Russians who who basically have soldiers there. They know by definition that is going to be an antagonistic position against the Ukrainians. And it, there's, they're not, both sides are effectively ignoring the authorities who really need to be able to control what happens to that nuclear power station. Because obviously, by definition, this would be a huge, huge incident for the whole of Europe, actually, and Russia, if it was to uh, melt down. You know, we have heard from President Zelensky for quite some time, you know, I want more. He wants more in terms of air defence. He certainly wants to get his hands on some fighter jets. As you might expect, he he basically criticised the Russians for attacking the civilian population of the country. He said, "You what you don't understand is that we're not going to give in. But you are trying to terrify people, trying to kill them, and that there will be effectively no surrender from Ukraine under any other circumstances. And I think what the point you're making, actually, is that these type of incidents, at the very least, by definition, if you think about it, when he asks for air defence, um, that's obviously a safety capability for the country. The donor nations are going to su- supply it because you need to be able to take these rockets Uh, missiles and drones out of the sky. When it comes to other more sophisticated weaponry, where we know tanks are pretty much on their way, will he get fighter jets? He certainly thinks so. He he knows there's a fair amount of convincing to do, but he definitely believes that eventually he will need them and that will be a game changer. I suspect it probably could be, but crucially, they need huge amounts of munitions. You know, they just actually need bullets and rockets of their own. And of course, at the same time, Russia does as well. And that's why we're seeing, I think, along this 600 mile front line, there's a lot of fighting taking place. But a lot of the time, it's actually almost ground to a halt. Now, some of that's to do with the weather. But mainly, I think it's because both sides are conserving their weapons for any uh, future offensives they may want to carry out. And the Ukrainians have made no secret that they intend to have one of their own come spring. And the Russians have made no secret that they are intending to do exactly the same if they aren't already, in fact. Let's focus then, shall we, on Bakhmut itself. Our team in Ukraine has also been speaking to those serving on the ground. First, Khalid Makiazo, a fighter in the Chechen battalion in the Ukrainian army, fighting in Bakhmut itself. We got someone in our newsroom to speak his words so that you can understand. The city of Bakhmut is under full control of Ukrainian forces. There are Wagner fighters on the outskirts. Their units are trying to break through into the city. There is heavy fighting. The situation is hard, but under control. We're trying to stop them getting inside. There are civilians inside the city. They're hiding in shelters and coming to humanitarian hubs to get food. 
Sometimes we deliver food there. Also, there are bodies of civilians, and we're trying to find a way to get them out to Ukrainian-controlled territory. Fighting is very intense. They're shelling the city the whole time. They're located on the outskirts and shelling, shelling all the time. They're destroying all residential houses and trying to make a path for themselves. But for now, we are controlling the situation. Now let's get an overview from Serhiy Cherawati, the spokesman for the Ukrainian Joint Forces Command in the east. It's the epicentre of fighting. The enemy is using all its power in this direction, on the outskirts of Bakhmut. Bakhmut is the hottest spot on the front line. The enemy is trying to break our defensive line, but they are failing. Ukrainian forces have been able to get ammunition and supplies into Bakhmut. They have also been able to evacuate injured people from there. Stuart, why has this town become such a focal point? Completely unremarkable city, to be honest, in the Donetsk region of the Donbass. And of course, the reason why it's significant for the Russians is because they've made it clear that they want to clear out and control the whole of the Donbass, which currently they don't. That is their uh, objective. That was the objective right from the start. And they have failed so far to do that. In fact, the Ukrainians have pushed back. Now, Bakhmut now is of no great tactical or strategic value to the Russians, because beyond it, both to the north and to the south, the Ukrainians are heavily dug in and from the south are planning their own offensives as well and are and are pretty certain to be able to protect themselves from the north. Why are they doing it? Well, I think it's a lot of a fight between the Wagner group. This is the mercenary group that has, I think, attempted to show the Russian military that they can actually get a victory after sort of six months without any, and symbolically show them that they really mean business and that by taking back mood, perhaps the rest of the military get a G up, if you like, and that they perhaps help their morale. I mean, 20,000, 30,000 Russian troops have lost their lives in this battle already. We think it's a, a case of sort of five to one Russian soldiers killed for every Ukrainian. And this is going on absolutely daily. Huge, huge numbers. The, Russian, the Ukrainian soldiers talk of, of the advancing Russian soldiers as literally stepping over the bodies of their comrades who have fallen in front of them. Many of these guys, these mercenaries, are actually ex-convicts. They've had very little training and they're just basically being used in a very old Russian military tactic, which is you win because you've just got more people than anyone else. Well, it's not working here particularly. They have made significant advances, but they haven't been able to get the Ukrainians out at all. Now, I think what... Bakhmut has become to Ukraine, interestingly, is a symbol of their defiance. And they really don't want to give it up. Again, it's not because it means too much to them. It's by no means the biggest city or the most important in that part of the country. So it really is one that they're just prepared to fight over. What we're describing here, you know, in, entrenched dug-in positions, wave after wave of attacks. It does have that feeling of the Somme, doesn't it? World War I. And I have to say, walking through the trenches, it is quite an eerie feeling when you're doing it because it seems, you know, trudging through mud and snow. It feels very odd and very like, you know, I can't believe now, 2023, that the pictures that we saw from 14 to 18, 1914, 18 World War One are actually being repeated in this in modern era. But they are. And I'll tell you why. It's because they're using effectively the same tactics. And that is basically just to grind each other down with continuous artillery. And that's exactly what has happened. You, t you talked earlier about the, the morale um, amongst the civilian population that had been attacked. I wonder what the morale is like amongst the Ukrainian troops stationed in those trenches. Very good. It's, you know, it's been going on for over a year. Many are clearly exhausted. Uh, they get under a new law about 10 days off a year, but all of them accept that logistically that is very hard to deliver on a guaranteed day and time, but they will get their time off. Some have not been home at all and haven't seen their families. And of course, a lot of their families will actually have left the country as well. So they just sort of committed to the front line. I think we know on, on a battlefield that this is an actual simple fact. It's, you can, it, it, it takes less men and it is easier to defend than it is to attack. So the Russians are much more likely to take casualties. And while Ukraine obviously carries out its own offensive um, expeditions as well, it's worth remembering that to them, it's always really about defending Ukraine. So even 
even if the tactic is to attack and it is more dangerous being on the offensive, they're defending their country. And I think you have um, a, an army and a volunteer army that believes in what they're fighting for, haven't been sent from another country, but are actually, if we lose here, then we lose everything. Stuart, can, can you conceive of any circumstances in which President Zelensky would, would just give up, uh, would, would just back away um, from what has been going on in, in Bakhmut? I can't see any any way. If we're specific about Bakhmut, yeah, he, he might well, he's already gone on record as saying, I'm not going to keep us fighting there until all of our guys, as he call them, are dead. He, he doesn't want to do that. But I think he, what he, his advisors and his military have, have, have decided is that they actually can perhaps pull this off, but certainly degrade the Russians to such an extent, as I say, that it might be worth doing. But I can't see him, if you, if you like, the whole battle, he's never, they're never going to give up. Ukraine is never going to give up. Uh, I just think that that's, it, this could go on forever, but they're just not going to give up. There's, 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 and I think there's too much international help for them to need to give up. The only way this comes to an end is some type of negotiated settlement, I believe. I can't see either side either winning or losing. And that's why you have this, this dreadful war just grinds on, because actually we're almost back to where we started. And it's hardly changed. After, when in 2014, if I look at the look at the maps then and now, there's almost no difference in them at all. So we've lost all these uh, soldiers for actually nothing. It's it's horrendous, actually. My thanks to Stuart Ramsey, our team in Ukraine, and of course to you for listening to the Sky News Daily with me, Neil Patterson. This episode was produced by Soila Aparicio with Alex Eden. Philly Bowman is our editor. <laughs>